and welcome everybody. I'm Sally Spencer Thomas, and I am co-founder and current president of United Suicide Survivors International. And we are very excited to have you with us tonight on our webinar on suicide loss in the workplace, what you need to know and how to help. Um, we'll introduce our guest in just a moment, but I wanted to welcome you all into this webinar and give you just a brief introduction of United Survivors. So United Survivors is a nonprofit, and we work internationally with um, people with lived experience with suicide. So that includes all kinds of people. It includes suicide loss survivors, attempt survivors, thought survivors, people who are supporting people who are fighting to stay, uh, people who are bereaved, the whole gamut. Um, and our goal is to really lift up the voices and the stories of people with lived experience with suicide um, for the purpose of social justice, for the purpose of systems and cultural change um, and so we're very excited to have you here. And I have just a few housekeeping items to cover before I turn it over to Sarah, who will introduce our speaker tonight. Um, I am a lost survivor, for those of you I don't know, and that's how I got into this work. And um, I wanted to just welcome all of you with lived experience who are here, and your voice matters. Um, tonight's presentation is being recorded, and we are also currently on Facebook Live. The recording will then be hosted on um, YouTube. If you had uh, colleagues maybe that couldn't make it in the live version tonight, they can catch it on YouTube when we um, do some light editing and then get it up there probably in the next week or so. It'll also be on our website, which is unitesurvivors.org. Um, we have you muted, but we definitely want to hear from you. So we were just doing a little warm up practice in the chat as people were coming in, they were introducing themselves. So please do so as well. Let us know where you're calling in from today. Um, if you're connected to an organization that's related to our conversation today. And then our fun fact is, you know, what's your favorite Thanksgiving side? If you want to share that too, we welcome it. Um, if you have questions as we go, just go ahead and put them in, in the chat. Um, we will do the Q&A at the end. And so we'll curate those questions and make sure Doreen has a chance to respond to them at the end. Um, and then uh, I think finally, um, just if you want to get engaged with us, we'd love to have you join us um, on, our, on our website. We have a, a page where you can just kind of say, I'd like to be a part of your community and uh, we'll welcome you in. And then you'll get updates on our future webinars. We have these once a month, you'll get a little, um, little uh, heads up email from us about coming in and we'd love to have you come back. So with that, I'll turn it over to our um, board member, Sarah Gear, and she will introduce Doreen. We are very excited to have Doreen here with us today. The reality is we spend an awful lot of time at work. And so just like anywhere else that we spend a lot of time having a suicide loss uh, has a deep, deep impact on the survivors left behind. And oftentimes we don't think of colleagues as survivors, but of course they are, and Doreen's going to tell us more about that. Uh, so Doreen is a psychologist with experience that spans uh, clinical, educational, and professional settings. Dr. Doreen Marshall has been engaged in local and national suicide prevention work for nearly 20 years. I was three. Um, just kidding, Doreen, you look amazing for 20 years in this work. Uh, you look amazing anyway, but especially for 20 years in this field. Since joining AFSP in 2014, Dr. Marshall has expanded AFSP's menu of education programs for both clinicians and general audiences and revamped the infrastructure to improve program deliver delivery uh, through na nationwide networks of chapters. In her current role, Dr. Marshall collaborates and partners with other organizations to advance AFSP's mission to save lives and bring hope to those affected by suicide. Prior to joining AFSP, she served in a number of roles, including as a consultant for both national and state suicide prevention and postvention initiatives, which included providing suicide prevention training for the Division of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities and serving on a task force for the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention. Without any further delay, Doreen, we'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks, Sally, and uh, to the United Survivors Board and group for having me. I'm really thrilled to give this webinar. Um, and for those of you that are just joining us, um, I am a clinician. Uh, my background, I'm a psychologist, and I started in suicide prevention 
what feels like yesterday and a long time ago, but um, it, it's about 20 years ago now, actually, this is my 21st year. And so uh, what I do full time is I am the vice president of mission engagement at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, which some of you may know as AFSP. And in that role, um, I work with lots of partner organizations, um, really just kind of extending our mission and sharing our work um, with organizations looking for collaborations. So this webinar is, is one of those collaborations. Uh, tonight, we're gonna be talking about suicide loss in the workplace. And I was saying to Sally, I think this is probably at the 20,000 foot view. Um, in terms of kind of just giving the overarching uh, ideas and things that we need to think about in terms of suicide loss in the workplace. I am a suicide loss survivor, similar to Sally, that's how I got into this work. I was in graduate school um, to, be, to go into the helping professions uh, when my fiance at the time died by suicide. And that was in the mid 90s and suicide prevention and certainly suicide postvention looked very different than, than it does now. Um, there are fewer resources and um, it really was uh, quite the world to navigate in terms of finding resources to help support. So um, with that, I, I would love it if some of you that are um, typing in the chat um, might just share kind of your connection to this issue if you're comfortable. Um, but also, uh, if you are a loss survivor, it would be great as we're talking uh, tonight to just kind of chime in with anything that resonates for you uh, during the presentation. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about um, just basically the impact of suicide loss and you know, specifically on individuals, but also how that connects to the workplace. We're gonna um, talk about some ways to support those within the workplace setting and uh, also identify some resources that I'm happy to share with you today. Uh, I, I do wanna tell a little bit of a story by way of beginning. And I, I think it, it's relevant and salient to what we're gonna discuss tonight. So, one of the things about my own loss experience was that I did not know a single other loss survivor uh, when my fiance died in 1995. Now I say that because there were other loss survivors around me clearly, but I did not, if you had asked me at the time to identify someone who had experienced a loss by suicide, I probably would have told you I didn't know anyone. And I think about that now because I think we're getting so much better at speaking openly about mental health and, and our, our experience as loss survivors. But even 20 something years ago, um, it still felt like this was there was a lot of stigma and I think more than there is today. And so when I had been uh, working at a counseling center um, when he died and when I went back to work, I was surrounded by counselors, which you would think would be a pretty good setting. Uh, to be in if you're grieving a suicide loss. Mm -hmm. And what stood out to me was that really no one knew what to say, um, that there was a real awkwardness. Everyone know, knew what had happened, but there wasn't really this open or easy conversation around it. And I remember coming back and um, I went into my office and they had left a stuffed animal on my chair, which was a nice gesture. But for me, you know, it, it kind of didn't make up for the lack of conversation or lack of ability to really even say the word. Um, and so this is the part of the story that I think is most relevant for us here. A couple of days after I was back at work, a colleague of mine who worked in the office next door came into my office and she put a phone number on the desk. And she said, um, I think you should call this person. She knows something about suicide loss. I think she would be someone good to talk to. And she started walking out of the room. And the only thing I could think to ask her was, well, where'd you get this number? How'd you even hear about this? And she said, my mother died by suicide when I was 16. And no one in this building knows that but you. And in that moment, I thought about you know, our professional identity as counselors, and this was someone I worked next door to, and how we had never talked about that. 
even though there was no question that 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 experience for her and certainly my experience for me would impact our clinical work and, and our lives profoundly going forward. Um, so I called that number and that number led me to the uh, first support group I went to and also led me uh, down a path that led to the work and brought me here today. So I say all of that because I don't think you can underestimate the importance of sharing a resource and doing it even in the workplace, which you know I think we often sometimes separate work from our personal lives, but we spend a lot of time at work. We build some of the strongest relationships we have in our life with coworkers. So to never underestimate, I think your role, if you're working with someone who's had a suicide loss as a coworker, just sharing a resource, what a big difference that can make. So moving on from there, um, I'd like you to think about before we dive in, you know, how you might encounter suicide loss in the workspace. Um, so, you know, I just shared something where I was an employee, you could think of it that way, that was returning to work, having had a personal loss. But I want you to think about what are some other ways we might come into contact with suicide loss in a workplace setting? And if you're comfortable putting that in the chat, that would be great, or commenting on that, that would be great. So one, one person wrote in that they work at, um, for the Air Force as a suicide prevention program manager. And I think that's a great example of, you, you may come into it um, in your work um, when a service member, for example, takes their life um, or a, a colleague takes their life, um, someone in the work setting. Uh, someone just typed in a uh, nurse suicide, you know, certainly for professions where there's, there's um, a different rate of suicide than other professions, we, we know that this may become part of our professional experience. Um, you know, another way to think about it is if someone uh, dies by suicide and they were a customer of the workplace. So, you know, we think about the customer relationships, for example, or um, a colleague, so someone you may have worked with professionally that was at another organization may have taken their life or experienced a loss by suicide. I mean, I think it's helpful to think about all of these different facets of, about how suicide loss intersects with workplace settings. Um, and someone else just uh, wrote in the chat that their um, favorite service writer died by suicide and the employees of that dealership were devastated. Uh, one other thing I should tell you just by way of my background, um, I, I've done a lot of work in suicide bereavement and one of the roles that I've been in um, was um, as part of that role, I was uh, responding to workplace suicide. So I say that because I can echo uh, what was said in the chat just about how devastating this can be to a work team, to a workplace. Um, it really is something that can really change the culture. And I think it's also an opportunity for workplace leadership to really send some messages out that are very pro mental health, positive and supportive. You know, I think we look to leaders in times of difficulty to help us know how we are to behave when something happens and that workplace is, is no exception there. And I think what a leader in a workplace does following a suicide death can really make a difference in terms of whether that's an open conversation and, and one that's met with support or whether um, it's a conversation that doesn't happen. I wanna differentiate a bit between um, suicide loss exposure and suicide loss impact. And you might think of these as kind of circles that live within one another. So you think about say a death, a suicide death that happens in a school, a student death. The entire student body and all of the faculty and staff are exposed to the suicide. But in terms of impact, there may be groups within that are more um, closely touched by the suicide loss. So then you might think about um, the grade level of the student who died. Uh, you might think about the classroom that a student was in, the teachers, the um, teammates, or the club members that may identify more as being impacted versus exposed. So knowing that someone at your school died by suicide, but not having uh, 
um, really like a, a deep connection or even a, a, maybe you didn't even know the person. So we talk about exposure versus impact because as we think about kind of how to help support folks, you can imagine in a workplace in a really large company, there might be lots of exposure, but the impact might be more centered um, or might be more focused on, on a smaller group of people versus a small company, you know, kind of a mom and pop run business where everyone that's exposed might be impacted um, for a small staff. And one of the things that we know is that in the research, the, the little research has been done really does support this, that suicide grief is associated with a number of negative health outcomes, um, including increased suicide risk. So now that's not the whole picture, obviously, but compared to people who have never had any exposure to a suicide loss, people who have been exposed to a suicide loss um, do have a high, uh, an increased risk for suicide compared to those who never have. Now, that's not the whole picture. Clearly, suicide is a complex picture, but it's something for us to be mindful of, that exposure does change a risk picture for, for those exposed. Um, and that what we know about suicide loss is that this can be a really prolonged grief experience. Um, for some, it's a complicated grief experience. I, I think it has aspects of a complicated grief experience, but for some, it, it truly meets the diagnosis of a prolonged or a complicated grief experience. And that has a, a, to do with impact, but it also has to do with lots of other things that we won't get into a lot of depth about today, but some of them would be relationship with the deceased, past history of trauma, particularly traumatic loss, um, one's own suicide history, whether that's suicide in your family, um, your own lived experience. So we should just know that these things intersect and rarely is a suicide grief experience simple, um, that these, these other factors do intersect. So um, some of the work done by Julie Sterrell and colleagues um, talks about this idea that um, and this is an estimate, but that for every one suicide, we estimate on average 135 people are exposed. And that of that 135 group, which is an estimate, one in five talk about it having a devastating impact or causing a major life disruption. And some of that one in five is going to be coworkers, colleagues, and those that the person who died knew in a professional setting. And like I said a few minutes ago, that's important because we know that the long trajectory without support is that some of the individuals um, will have some negative outcomes as a result of that impact. So this is why we talk about it. And this is why we really empower workplaces um, to be proactive in terms of um, knowing how you might respond if you have a suicide death of an employee or if your workplace is connected to suicide in another way, a colleague from another organization, a customer, um, you get the idea. So most of us that are suicide loss survivors can tell you the emotional experience of suicide loss is, is a complex one. Um, lots of emotions changing, often cycling pretty rapidly, that in the course of a given day, or for some folks even hour to hour, there's feelings of anger and, and sadness and guilt or sense of responsibility. Um, they may have a traumatic response and may activate some things that really look like what we think of as acute stress or post-traumatic stress. So nightmares or flashbacks or those kinds of things. Um, certainly there's a sense of isolation and this has been written about a lot in the literature about suicide loss survivors often um, feel stigma and perceive stigma. So whether anyone is actually stigmatizing them, there's this sense of I'm different, my experience is different. And you know, when I think about my own experience, I one of the ways I described it to people was that it felt like I was wearing a neon sign that said this had happened, even though lots of people I encountered in a day to day did not know that. Like, but it felt that way to me. And so I think that's the case that many lost survivors experience the sense of, even if I haven't told certain people around me, there's this sense that I'm wearing it, that, that people know that 
um, and that I'm somehow marked by it. Like that was very much a feeling I remember having. And so I think that is something that because of that, you can imagine when a suicide loss survivor returns to the workplace, how there's this sense of kind of confusion around who knows what, and this feeling that others know and will treat me differently because they know. We also know that one of the pieces of the emotional experience that lots of loss survivors feel is this sense of responsibility or what I like to reframe as regret. So this sense of that hindsight is 2020 and if I could go back, I would do things differently or I might say something or not say something. I mean, the actions leading up to another person's suicide death are often under the microscope for the lost survivor. And, you know, if you think about how this could play out in a workplace, you know, we don't always get along with our colleagues. And there might be this sense of, um, I was in conflict with someone, or I didn't take the opportunity to reach out, even though I knew this person was struggling. There might be a sense of, I was very close to this colleague, and yet I had no idea they were struggling. So, you know, lost survivors often feel this sense of regret that if I could go back, there are things I would have wanted to do or, or maybe not do that maybe might've changed the outcome. Now we have no way of knowing, of course, whether it would or not, but the lost survivor feels that at a, at a very deep level. So th these are some things that lost survivors talked about. Um, I, I just pulled some quotes from different places um, in our work. Um, I'll, I'll just read these aloud just for our, our experience here. The shock and grief we felt after their suicide death was unbearable. We didn't understand why they wanted to die and we blamed ourselves. Then there's the silence that often comes when someone mentions their name. People don't know how to react so they don't say anything at all. And then another person, I didn't think people like them died by suicide. So you have those that have been exposed or impacted to uh, or by a suicide death, really kind of wrestling with this sense of, you know, if they were close and impacted closely, there may be this sense of self blame or, you know, we could have done something different. Um, there might be this sense that if the workplace isn't directly speaking about the person who died or speaking about the suicide loss, there's this uncomfortable silence when the person's name comes up or when we talk about kind of work transitioning, um, like no one is really talking about, no one's talking about the elephant in the room about what's happened. And then I think for some people in the workplace who may not have had any experience with suicide or knew much before the exposure, they may have like have been confronted with some uh, stereotypes they had about suicide. I didn't think someone like them would die by suicide. Um, and maybe really confronting um, some of the, the myths that they may believe about suicide. I think we've said this, but um, I think it's important to just know that um, not everyone who experiences a suicide loss needs a, a therapist or a clinical intervention. In fact, most people will um, work through a suicide loss without any clinical intervention. And often people who are having a hard time um, acclimating to the loss is really the term we use. That's where we know more intervention is needed. And we should remember that our, our response to suicide, our response to death and grief is often culturally informed. It's informed by how we were raised, talking about mental health, suicide and grief. Um, it can be um, whether we believe we should have a masculine or feminine presentation in our grief. Um, and that I'm talking about just the stereotypes around that. But how we respond is often informed by all of those cultural dimensions, as well as race, ethnicity, um, and the, you know, the other things that may have influenced how we think about suicide and grief. Okay, so let's dig in a little more into workplace postvention. Um, when we use the term postvention, we're really talking about a coordinated professional response versus um, a peer support or just a support response. And again, that's not just limited to therapy support. We're really talking about just any coordinated um, response that is in response to the suicide death. And we often think of it as following a public health model where 
there might be some folks who need a more focused or a more specific um, level of support or intervention, whereas those exposed might really need a, a broader, um, uh, a broader uh, support, information, for example, or um, you know, resources at a very broad level versus someone who may need very specific resources because they've been impacted in a more profound way. And we talk about postvention as really being part of prevention, that because suicide loss survivors um, are in a higher risk category versus non-loss survivors, that the work we do to help support their grief trajectory is really a form of suicide prevention. So, you know, when we think about some aspects of workplace postvention, and if you're on tonight and thinking about this from a workplace perspective, your manager, or you oversee uh, HR or um, workplace policies, you know, what this is often closest to is policies on employee death, which a lot of companies have. If your workplace does not have an employee death policy, um, this would be a good time to think about having one, but also um, to think about how suicide, a suicide death might change or alter any aspects of that policy. So one of the things that's unique about suicide deaths is that there's a real emphasis on communication and safe messaging as part of that. And when I say safe messaging, I'm talking about messaging about suicide that um, does not increase the risk of contagion or the risk of others being negatively impacted by the communication. So we think of communication as internal, you know, what do we tell the rest of the workplace about what's happened? We think of it as external. What do we tell others who may have interfaced with this individual, um, colleagues, customers, about what has happened? Um, we also think about it more broadly um, in, in workplace deaths where the person who died was very high profile, a CEO, for example, or one group I worked with, a rabbi of a large congregation had taken his life. And you know, you're thinking about communication internally, but there might also be media coverage or there might also be others who are um, tasked with communicating this externally beyond the workplace uh, customers, beyond employees, really to the, the rest of the world. So if you think about uh, suicide deaths where there's media coverage, where there might be a news article, where the, the company may have to release a press release or something responding to what's happened. One aspect of workplace postvention I think is important is to know who's doing what, um, and that really has a lot to do with role clarification. So understanding that if you provide an EAP resource to your employees, what, what the experience is going to be like if they contact that resource. Um, I had a colleague tell me about a situation where someone was, um, after a suicide death, someone was pointed to EAP, and what ended up happening was EAP pointed them back to the workplace. So making sure you know what's going to happen if you point a, an individual to HR, to a, EAP, and who's doing what. Certainly that's the case if any outside consultation is brought in or any outside clinical services. You know, the other thing I think workplaces need to think about when there is an employee death that is this sense of balancing privacy with compassion and the company's needs. And it really is a balancing act. So, you know, I think about this idea of privacy. Um, you know, what you share and how much detail you share, um, you know, while it's okay to inform everyone at the company uh, that the person has died, if the family is not public about being suicide, a suicide death, um, they may have a concern if the employer talks about it that way. Um, if the employer does let the other employees know it's been a suicide death, then there's the question of, well, how much information should be known? And um, how do we handle follow-up questions while maintaining the privacy of the individual who died? Um, and this, this intersects all sorts of things, it intersects HR and intersects around an employee's uh, health history. So, you know, balancing that privacy piece, but also recognizing that um, if we approach this with compassion that and respond to, you know, people's, you know, the survivors trying to make sense of what's happened, um, 
you know, I think we can balance these things. I think it just requires being intentional. And then the last piece of this, the company needs, you know, and this gets really pragmatic. So it's things like assigning the person who's, who died's office to another person or um, transferring their workload to someone else. Um, these are things we need to think about, approach with compassion, and balance the things that maybe need to have more quick need to happen more quickly with doing it in a way that doesn't um, doesn't lack compassion or, or not recognize um, the profoundness of the loss that occurred. Certainly, there's a need for follow up, and you may notice that employees are having different reactions to this, but that it may be that it's also impacting how they're able to come to work. While it's rare when a suicide death occurs at a workplace setting, um, you may find that other employees have difficulty returning to the setting, for example. And then of course, the importance of sharing resources and what's appropriate in terms of resources and when do you point people outside of the workplace resources such as HR, EAP, um, the, the managed care company that the employee works with. So another way we might find ourselves intersecting with uh, suicide loss in the workplace is someone, and I, I responded to this quite often actually, where someone on a work team had a suicide loss in their personal life, they've been out of work a week or two weeks, and now they're coming back to work, and the work team wants to know what can we do to support them? How can we um, what should we say? What should we do? I mean, there's often this sense of we don't know what to do. Um, and I always say when people don't know what to do in the absence of knowing what to do, they often do nothing. And that can really feel damaging to the lost survivor. So th these are some ideas. Um, and this actually has come from a really great resource um, out of Australia. Uh, Australia has done terrific work in the post pension space. Um, and this is from an organization called Beyond Blue. Um, and they talk about this idea of really the manager or the supervisor working one-on-one -on -one and that being kind of a regular dynamic process um, that responds to the employee's needs and also makes adjustments as needed. So really hearing from the person who's been impacted by suicide and saying, okay, how can I help? What is it you need? What do you want to keep managing? What do you need some support or do you need us to delegate? And really treating that dynamically. Um, recognizing that th this loss may have really profoundly impacted the person's day-to-day -day life. Think about an employee who was a parent who just lost their spouse and suddenly they've gone from, from co-parenting to being a single parent. Um, that can mean they need a change to work hours. That can mean they're spread much more thinner than they were at home before. Um, so really recognizing that they may be dealing with things in their personal life that, that will spill over or will um, come into their work life. Certainly the sense of unpredictable um, emotions that most lost survivors talk about it, as a normal part of grieving, but to know that this can come up in the workplace. So it can get triggered by, by really something fairly benign. Um, it may, certain things may, um, you may notice someone tearing up during a meeting. Um, and, and not knowing what to do, but certainly empowering the employee to take breaks or to do what they need to do to take care of themselves in the moment. And then I think it always helps for coworkers and others to learn a little bit about suicide loss so you know how best to support the person. Um, so when a coworker, you know, familiarizing yourself, giving them space, don't push, but also inviting them to things without isolating them. So saying, hey, you know, I just thought maybe we'd go get coffee and then opening the door if they wanna talk about what's happened, but also being okay that if it's not the time. Um, what I've heard from many lost survivors is that work became a welcome distraction, that it was a place they could go and not talk about it when they were talking, having to talk about it a lot at home or with family. So kind of being sensitive that some employees may really not want to spend the workday talking about the loss. They may actually find it helpful not to, whereas others may really have a need to kind of talk with those they work with about what they're experiencing. And then I, I added a couple of things to this, um, to not be afraid to say their loved one's name and to make it okay for them to share memories. You know, we don't want, I think anyone who's lost someone to suicide knows this, but, 
in the beginning, it becomes about how they died. But as, as you move through grief, you want to be able to talk about the person who died and all of the, the positive memories that you have. Um, and then the other thing I'd say is to never make any assumptions. Um, I learned about this pretty, um, pretty profoundly in a support group I used to run uh, for suicide bereaved. Um, we had been going around in the group and everyone was introducing themselves and talking about the person who died and really talking about the profoundness of the loss and the missed relationship. And when we got to this one person, um, she said, my experience is not like any of this. Um, I lost uh, my ex-spouse um, who had been stalking me at the time of his death. And um, the biggest thing I feel right now is relief for myself, for my children, because I feel safe and I can't even begin to process the grief yet. So don't assume, you know, not one size fits all. People have different grief trajectories, but often their experience may be very different and what they're dealing with in the moment might be very different versus what they deal with over time. In the last few minutes we have left, I do wanna to point to some resources. Um, certainly I think one of the best resources we have in the field is the manager's guide uh, to suicide postvention in the workplace. Sally Spencer Thomas, this was um, a document out of the an Action Alliance Task Force workplace task force. Um, Sally, um, Maggie Mortali from AFSP and others were on that task force produced an excellent document that I think provides a terrific guide for workplaces. Um, I served on the task force uh, for suicide loss as did Sally and we have um, a general guideline document around uh, responding to suicide loss. So uh, that's another document out of the Action Alliance that I would certainly recommend folks take a look at. I mentioned Beyond Blue, um, Australia has some terrific postvention resources and I encourage folks if you, um, if you run into an end and you're not finding what you're looking for in terms of US resources to take a look at the work done out of Australia or some really terrific guides and other things for the workplace that have been developed. Um, then there's some more specific work plate, what I think of as kind of workplace guides. Um, you know, there's some for different professions. AFSP has some for veterinary medicine. Um, we also have um, the After Suicide Toolkit for Schools that talks about school postvention. Um, the um, Higher Ed uh, Mental Health Alliance has one for postvention on college campuses. So again, you're going to start to see, and I think over time this is going to get more and more the case, where there's more specific workplace postvention guides. Some more general uh, suicide loss resources. And if you are a suicide loss survivor joining us tonight and you're not familiar with these resources, I'd certainly encourage you to check out these web pages. Lots of great information. Um, the Alliance of Hope um, um, is really a peer run or community um, run website where there's message boards and they have large engagement with loss survivors um, across that site. Certainly um, the organization I work for, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, we have tons of resources. I'm gonna talk about a few more of ours in a minute. Uh, Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors or TAPS really looks at military loss. And um, there's a, a subset of that loss that is suicide loss. So certainly check out their work. And then I love the work that Kathy Shear and colleagues are doing at Columbia uh, at the Center for Complicated Grief, which looks at all sorts of uh, complicated grief, but also looks at suicide loss and how um, some suicide loss survivors have a complicated grief or prolonged grief experience. Before we go to questions, I just wanna say a couple things about AFSP. Um, just if you don't know our work, I really encourage you to take a look. And we have a few things coming up that I'd like to point people to. So we do work across a number of domains. Uh, we're the largest private funder of suicide prevention research in the United States. And we do have suicide loss research as an organization priority in terms of funding suicide loss research. That's been a priority for a number of years and will continue. Um, we have an advocacy arm and we do lots of programming in prevention education and loss and healing. We have chapters in all 50 states and uh, we have something called the interactive screening program, which is used by colleges and workplaces across the country um, and is a way to connect employees and students to, more directly to help. In terms of suicide loss, we have a program called Healing Conversations. And that program is a peer 
program. So it's trained loss, suicide loss survivors meet with the newly bereaved to share resources, to kind of connect first with that firsthand experience. And so we try and match those who request a visit, and that can be done by phone, video chat, or in person. Um, we try and match them with someone who's had a similar loss. So a spouse who's lost a spouse or someone who's lost a child with another parent who's lost a child. And it's for a conversation, a sharing of resources. Um, when possible, we try and find someone from their state or their local area so that they can talk about resources that may be closer to the lost survivor, but it's really a way to help introduce the newly bereaved to support. Um, our healing conversations program, you can find it at afsp.org forward slash healing conversations. Each year we have, we host around the country uh, sites that put on events for International Survivor of Suicide Loss Day. It's always uh, the Saturday before American Thanksgiving. Um, and this year it's coming up, um, and you will see we have events listed on our, our website. You can register for an event or there's also virtual events, um, online events. If you don't wanna go to a, a physical event, an in-person event, you can also find online events uh, that are happening that day. And it's an opportunity for suicide loss survivors to connect. We often share a documentary that AFSP has produced um, and have kind of a viewing and discussion of it. And we also do a Facebook Live event on AFSP Nationals uh, Facebook Live, uh, a Facebook account. So that day we also do, if you follow us on Facebook, you'll, you'll see notifications as the day gets closer um, of our Facebook Live event on Saturday. This is just a list of other resources, most of which you can find on our website and are free. Um, we also maintain a list of uh, clinicians who have completed a suicide bereavement training so if you're looking for a therapist and you want to see who's even had any training in this, you can see the list of those on our website who have completed a training that's uh, done by Jack Jordan that AFSP supports. If you're interested in finding a chapter, there's information. If you're looking for general loss resources, um, just forward slash suicide loss, you'll find many of the resources I just mentioned. Our survivor day to register for an event and our healing conversations program. And then, of course, I'd be remiss to say we are big supporters of the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and the Crisis Text Line, and we continually share that information, including with suicide loss survivors, um, so they have it, so that they can share it with those who may be struggling. So with that, again, I want to thank um, Sally and her team, and just thank you for attending, and I think we will now go to questions. Thank you so much. A couple of questions that were coming up through Facebook Live. Um, one was, one of the ways we didn't talk about how suicide impacts the workplace is workers who are impacted by um, the public suicide. So somebody talked about the Coast Guard, um, first responders, uh, you know, sometimes people die by suicide, um, you know, in a construction site and it's the construction workers, even though it wasn't their colleague, um, they're impacted because they're a witness or they're responding to it. And, you know, that kind of exposure is, can be very traumatic. So how are those workplaces that have a higher likelihood of engaging with a stranger's suicide because of their role at work? How are we getting, um, becoming proactive around those types of workplace suicide incidents? I mean, it's, it's a really important question. And Sally, I know you have been steeped in this work for some time, particularly looking at um, occupational groups and kind of working with some of those that have, um, as an occupation, have a higher risk or higher rate of suicide. Um, you know, I think one of the things is just being proactive is probably the biggest message. Like you don't wanna be scrambling once this happens to figure out what to do. And I think particularly in the world of social media and other communications, news travels fast. And if you as an employer are, are slow on the response, you're really missing the opportunity, not only to provide support, but to get ahead of what might be a negative message. So, you know, often um, myths get perpetuated about suicide and why it happens. Um, a workplace might even get blamed um, for suicide death. So, you know, I, I can't emphasize enough what you said about the proactive nature of that. Um, I, I think the other piece, and this kind of counterbalances the message, I think, 
um, the majority of people who die by suicide are of working age, right? They're in that um, 16 to 64 year old, right? If we look at numbers. Um, at the same time, suicide in the workplace is still pretty rare. And so I think the occupations that know that they are more likely to encounter suicide, the onus is really on them to be proactive. But I think something any workplace can do is take a look at your employee death policy. Take a look at your, um, how, you how you support people when they've experienced the death, you know, your bereavement policy, your time off policy. And ask yourself the question, if this death was a suicide or if this coworker was, was um, grieving a suicide, would this policy still hold up? Or are there things that need to be more specific or clearer if this is a suicide death? Yeah, I, I, I see where you're going with the high-risk industries. I'm also thinking about when a worker's job puts them in the direct line of somebody ah, else's suicide, so media. Uh, first responders, um, somebody brought up like Coast Guard or the bridge workers, you know, where they are getting overexposed because of their line of work to somebody else's who's not a co-worker's suicide death. Yeah, and that's so I'm thinking, clear. I, yeah, yeah I, I'm thinking like, you know, about onboarding and training about, you know, protection that we can do around those particular job duties um, where, where we know just because of the nature of their work, firefighters, mm -hmm. EMTs, they're going to be highly exposed. I mean, I think this is a really important point, Sally, that I, and you said the word onboarding, but I think that's part of like this proactive, right? Is that I, and you might know this too, Sally, but as a clinician, I don't think I had a full awareness of the likelihood I would right. be exposed to suicide in my work until I was pretty far into my work. Um, meaning that no one in grad school told me you're likely, you know, it's not a matter if or when, but you're likely to encounter suicide, not only suicide deaths, but attempts. And, you know, I think you don't have a frame on that when you're entering a profession. And so I think the more we can have that be an open conversation on the front end, right? And then also you, it's an opportunity for education, right? To get ahead of the myths and the things that people may have learned about suicide that just aren't true. Um, I know I'm, I'm preaching the choir with you, Sally, but train. this is where training and education are so important and really equipping folks, I think, to do things like debriefing within their profession if they're exposed regularly and finding ways to um, not carry that with them if it's part of their day-to-day -day occupation. Excellent, thank you. Go ahead, Sarah. Yes, I kind of want to piggyback on some of that conversation actually, Doreen, uh, because you know, having worked with first responders and going in and doing unfortunately a pretty significant amount of postvention, um, I felt like a hypocrite to be honest with you, because I'm in there saying like, we should be doing this and we should be doing that and we need to do this. And then um, I had to acknowledge to myself, our field, the mental health field, the suicide prevention field, we're not doing any of these things that we're out trying to convince construction workers to do. So my question to you is, do you have any thoughts on what do we have to do? Because suicides do happen in the mental health field. We do lose clinicians, we lose crisis workers, we lose um, clinical directors, I've, I've responded to that. Um, so my question to you is what do we have to do and what, what should we be doing to draw some attention to our, our own field? I think it's, I mean, it's such an excellent question and um, a mutual colleague of ours, Dave Jobes, who I know both of you know, um, talks about this idea of like, even in our clinical work, talking with clients and families about suicide as a potential outcome. Um, not that our clinical work causes it, but that just like doctors, when they review before you go in for surgery, these are the possible outcomes of this particular um, thing you're, you're dealing with or this ailment that we're addressing to really kind of talk with people on the front end about, well, here's what we know about suicide. Here's how it intersects with mental health. Here's why managing your stress is important and really kind of on the front end of working with people helping them understand how, how they might encounter this. Because I think when we don't talk it, we're kind of, when we don't talk about it, we're complicit in the silence, right? And we expect our, the, the person we're working with clinically to bring it up. We expect you know, our colleague to say, hey, I need consultation around this versus proactively asking, is anybody working with someone who's at risk for suicide and needs, you know, needs to debrief or talk about 
um, you know, what they're working with and how we, we might best support them. Um, I think the other thing though, and I'll say this quickly, is that in professions like the first responders and I'd say clinicians as well, one of the challenges is um, to do our work, we have to be some detached. And I'd say that's the case for law enforcement and others. But I think the part of us that's able to support law survivors has to be very connected to our humanness. And that's a challenge, right? So you're finding this balance of not over connecting with what happened, but knowing that the only way I can support this person in front of me is by connecting to the human piece of what I'm experiencing. And you know, when I've worked with lost survivors that have talked about their experiences with first responders, for example, you kind of hear, you hear the extremes, right? You hear the folks who were so detached. I remember one lost survivor telling me how the first responders weren't able to say anything to her, but she heard them talking about the basketball game that was happening that night. And she couldn't, she just couldn't connect with like what was going on. Like, how could they? Like, didn't they see what's happening here? But for them, I'm sure it was just the, I need to distance. Uh, the, other, the other extreme is um, first responders who have been incredibly supportive, right? Who said, let me sit with you. Is there someone I can help you call? Like really taking that extra step to say, I don't, I don't know exactly what to say, but, but I'm here to help you and I'm here to support. So finding that balance, I think, is really what we can be more proactive in doing and acknowledging that it is a balance. I was thinking too, as you were talking, Sarah, about the Clinician Survivors Task Force and the work of Nina Guten and Vanessa McGann saying, no, we saw you coming and we are prepared to support you in not only what is personally very difficult, but professionally very difficult when you're going through a review and potential lawsuits and all these other kinds of things that, yeah, we need to do a much better job in both preparing mental health providers for the possibility of this happening during their career. And then on the back end, making sure we've got supports in place. Um, another question during that came up um, in the, in the chat was about kind of return to work. So most workplaces, if they have a bereavement policy, you've got three days, if it's a first degree family member, you know, a son, a, a partner, a parent, a sibling, um, and then you, you're expected more or less to come back in your full role. Um, and for most people, um, the complications of the overlay of trauma and grief and all of the you know, the biases we have around, I mean, it's just really hard to have that level of expectation that you're going to be a fully functioning employee. Um, yeah, maybe coming back to work is a good move just to be reconnected and plugged into a pattern and a routine, but the expectation of being productive, um, Jess Stolman Rainey and I wrote a, a chapter on workplace postvention, and she brought to light the idea that the, the, the work of grief and the work of work are very opposite. The work of grief is slow. It's very reflective, process-oriented. Uh, the work of work is often efficient and get it done and all of that. And to have those competing expectations three days after uh, losing somebody is hard. So how can we advocate for you know, better accommodations for people so we don't lose people after a suicide death when we, we could have helped support them in that grief? Yeah, I mean, this is, gosh, it's such a, we could probably spend another hour on this question alone. Um, you know, I think what you're saying is, is, is the right thing, is to think about this, if you're a workplace manager, or think about this as an aspect of employee retention, <laughs> right? Because if you make it impossible for the person to come back and to do their grief work, something's going to give. And um, it may be that they leave. <laughs> and so if you really are committed to having someone stay with your organization and to support them through it, then you have to think about the way suicide impacts their life. And it's not only the grieving process, which is exhausting and takes lots of energy and unpredictable, but it's also like the pragmatics of it. You know, if you think about, you know, typical bereavement, you get three days off or whatever. Well, if you're, you know, a first degree family member, you may barely get through the funeral in three days let alone all the other things that have been impacted in your life as a result of, of what's happened. So, you know, I mean, this is where compassion matters. And when you think about, you know, why people stay with certain employers or why they leave, you know, it's often, you know, I think about this a lot. Um, 
in my personal life. One of um, one of the employers I stayed with for a long time. Part of the reason I stayed with them for a long time is because they were so compassionate when my father died, not by suicide, but they were so compassionate to that grieving process that it made me feel like I was connected to that workplace in, in a really strong way. And so I say that because I do think it can only benefit workplaces to, to be compassionate and caring and flexible when this happens. I mean, this is, this is a trauma, it's unexpected. And I think for many people, the grief goes I mean, it goes on for quite some time. And I'll just emphasize, um, it's not just the first degree family members, it's the friends, it's the coworkers, it's the partners that are not acknowledged, you know, in, in different ways. It's, you know, all of this matters. And if we can give just a little bit of grace around a very difficult experience like suicide loss, we can get to retain uh, really great employees and not have them go through this cascading domino effect of I lost my loved one, then I lost my job, then I lost my house, then I lost my family, you know, whatever those domino mm -hmm. effects that start to fall over. Um, we'll go ahead and show those last two slides and we'll go ahead and close. Thank you, everybody who's coming out today. We'll just highlight a couple more things before we go into the final uh, piece here, the wrap up. Um, and one is to join us. Um, we are on all the social media places and we would love to connect with you there. We'd love to hear your ideas of future webinars, future speakers you'd like us to share. Some of our best ideas actually come from all of you. So please uh, send us your, your thoughts that way. Um, and then finally, our next month's Twitter, uh, webinar um, from United Survivors is from our board member, Dr. Marlon Rollins who is a uh, clinical director of a substance use recovery program in California. And he's also a suicide loss survivor. Um, so he's gonna be speaking on the intersection of suicide risk and stigma, um, as well as substance use disorders. And so please join us on December 14th um, at 8 p.m. Eastern time um, to hear Dr. Marlins talk about his thoughts on the intersection of these issues. Thank you everyone, and we'll see you next month. Thanks again.